World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from world capitals, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's John Daly with a summary of headline news as received in New York. A year ago today, at exactly this time, World News Today began with these words. The White House has just announced that Jap planes have attacked Pearl Harbor. This means war. In the days that followed, an angry nation could only guess at the damage the treacherous blow had caused. Today, we know the full story. And today, we can be filled with pride that our armed forces, fighting a terrible uphill battle in the Pacific, have already paid back in some measure for what President Roosevelt has called a day of infamy. The sneak attack, to all practical purposes, eliminated our Pacific battle fleet at the time. We know now why the Philippines could not be reinforced. We know now why a pitiful handful of American and Allied cruisers were sent out to face a Jap battle fleet in the Netherlands' East Indies fighting. Those were black days, but they are well behind us. A few weeks ago, a rehabilitated American fleet, though heavily outnumbered, handed another Jap battle fleet in the Solomon area a licking it will never forget. And just now, the Navy Department issued a communique saying that we have killed better than 400 more Japs on Guadalcanal. We'll have the full details from Washington shortly. A year ago, we had, we may have been among the it-can't-happen-here boys, but now we have gone back to the old American tradition. Put your faith in God and keep your powder dry. One of our allies has a good reason to celebrate today. It's the first anniversary of the start of the Russian winter offensive last year that saved Moscow. Then the Germans were within 18 miles of the city. Today, they are on the receiving end of heavy Russian attacks on front 130 to 250 miles west of Moscow. In the last 24 hours, 10,000 Germans have been killed, and 160 guns and 54 tanks destroyed. The Nazis are putting up stiff resistance, and it's clear that reinforcements have been poured into the Stalingrad area, where the Russians admit the Nazis are using heavy tank forces. But there is every indication that the Red Army is still moving ahead, and that the German position is critical. Their army is still inside Stalingrad, but today's reports indicate that they have been pushed back into the northern and southern outskirts of the city in the last ten days. On the central front, the Nazis are using big fleets of air transport to bring up men and supplies. One Soviet anti-aircraft battery shot down 12 of them and damaged seven more. Generally, the exact position west of Moscow is confused, but there is reason to believe that Rezhev, the key to the German defenses, is surrounded. As at Stalingrad, the Germans are counterattacking desperately, and the Russians described the fighting as particularly bitter. German attacks succeeded in capturing two or three villages, but Soviet counterattacks took the villages back, and field dispatches covering the fighting west of Moscow said that three more basic points in the German defenses near Rezhev and two near Velikia Luki had been cleared of the Nazis. Yes, this is a day of celebration for the Russians. Much of their country is still in German hands, but they have blasted the myth of the invincibility of the German Wehrmacht and with confidence have set out to destroy the despoilers of their country. In North Africa, the Allied lines near Teboba and Jadeda are straight and unbroken as the fighting grows in intensity and Allied reinforcements pour up to the front. French and American units moving forward in the southern sector are reported by the Morocco radio to have captured a new Axis-fortified position near Sfax. Now for a direct report, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers' Charles Collingwood reporting. This is Charles Collingwood at Allied Force Headquarters in North Africa. No part of the battle for Tunisia is more important than the battle in the air. And General Doolittle's boys of the 12th Air Force are doing a magnificent job. Here in the makeshift studio that we've rigged up in Allied Force Headquarters, we have a couple of boys who are very lucky to be here. Wouldn't you say you were lucky to be here, fellas? Well, I'll say we were. And you're not kidding. That was Lieutenant Dave Slater and Sergeant Ray DeVilla. Both of them from Houston, Texas, and both of them flying in the same bomber. And that Alaska that you heard in the background came from the rest of the crew who are all packed in here watching Lieutenant Slater and Sergeant DeVilla getting ready to tell us how it came to be that they're all able to be here. Well, come on now, Slater. You're the pilot. Tell us about it. Well, you see, this is our first combat mission. You mean your very first? That's right. Well, this has nothing to do with the story, but were you scared? Well, I was scared. I don't know about the rest. You know, I was scared. Well, <laughs> I'll bet you were. Well, let's get on with it. Where were you going on this first combat mission? 
We were bombing Gabby. We had an escort of P-38 pursuit. We got over the car we ran into an awful lot of anti-aircraft fire. And remember, Lieutenant Fighter, that's when we all stopped being scared. That's right, Devella. And it was just as well, too. Because to make a long story short, we got hit. You got hit? Bad? Well, bad enough. I could feel this light start hitting us, but I didn't know where until I looked down at my pressure gauge and saw the port engine wasn't working. Well, what did you do then? Well, uh, let me tell him. Okay, Devella, you tell him. You see, the way we were hit, a medium bomber came fly as far. This center plate kept us in the air as long as we could, but we finally had to get back on an even eel and land. Anybody hurt? No, sir. We hit it about 150 yards, and then we all jumped out and nothing worse than losers. The Lieutenant Slater counted noses. Lieutenant Howard was the co-pilot from San Diego, California. Lieutenant Hayden, the navigator from Walmart, Arkansas. Sergeant Duran, the weight gunner from Muscatine, Iowa. And Sergeant Fleshman, from Conway, Oregon, who's our tail gunner. All okay, but we were all miles behind the enemy line. Right out in the desert. Well, what did you do then? We started taking this thing out of the plane and getting ready to burn it. And then the air starts popping up. Wait a minute, Ray. You haven't said anything about the P-38 yet. Oh, yes. I should have said we saw this P-38 from our escort circling around above us. Then it went off, we hope, to get help. Well, what about these errors that popped up? Well, they kept arriving from nowhere in particular, and by the end, we collected about 25 of them. Were they friendly? They kept seeing American or Ali Mon. When we finally convinced them that we were American, everything was fine. But they don't like the Germans, huh? These fellas didn't. But they called us comrades. Oh, there's another word they use, Ray. Eh? Oh, yes. They kept saying Ike Ike or something like this until this moment. I still don't know what it means. Well, well, look, one thing that I haven't got straight yet. Uh, how far was all this from the German garrison at Davis? About 20 miles. 20 miles? And how long were you there? Two hours and 41 minutes, and that was long enough. Well, how did it finally end? Oh, simple enough. One of the ARAP said, shh, and we all listened, and we heard some airplane motors. Then we saw a light bomber and two P-38s coming our way. The bomber saw us, landed on that awful rough desert, and taxied right up to it. That's right. And Lieutenant Hollow of Seattle climbed out and said, jump in, boys, jump in quick. And I'll bet you did, too. And what's then? What happened here? Then Lieutenant Howard was set out of the R plane, and the P-38 finished it off with incendiary bullets. And we were off. Nothing to it. If you ask me, there was plenty to it. And I'm darn glad that you fellows all made it and could be here tonight. We return you now to CBS in New York. On the old North African front, for several days, the dispatchers have been reporting a lull in the fighting. Today's report had nothing to say about the land fighting. And it's true that there hasn't been much land fighting since Marshal Rommel and his fleeing Africa Corps hold themselves up in the natural defenses of El Aguila. But actually, there has been no lull in the battle for Libya. There haven't been many tank and infantry clashes of any great consequences, but fierce air fighting is in progress for control of the Mediterranean, and Cairo is doing its part to help the Tunisian campaign. And now for further news from across the Atlantic, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Bob Trout reporting. From Britain, flying fortresses attack the locomotive works at Leo this afternoon. The weather was clear and good results were seen. At the same time, liberators attacked the airfield at Abbeville. Squadrons of Royal Air Force, United States Army Air Force, Dominions, and Allied fighters gave protection. Seven enemy fighters were destroyed. One of our fighters and two bombers are missing. Sir William Beveridge spoke to a big meeting at Oxford today and drew for his audience a picture of a new Britain after the war. To think of this now, he said, is not to neglect the war. Victory in war and victory in peace are inseparable. Then he named five specific evils to be attacked. What, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. What Sir William Beveridge urged today at Oxford is the setting up of an economic general staff to make a national design for the use of Britain's national resources. Of course, none of this is going to come easily. And that's all right with Sir William Beveridge, who said, there are no easy times ahead in war or peace. Who wants not? London Sunday newspapers appeared today with carefully worded little stories written by the journalists the British call political correspondents. These all said that the political correspondent of, fill in the name of the paper here, 
understands that Minister for Air, Sir Archibald Sinclair, has been invited to be the next Viceroy of India, and it is believed that he will accept. This is a recognized method in Britain, as in other countries, of sending up a trial balloon. The British call it flying a kite. And the idea here, just as in the United States, is, if the cautious little newspaper items bring roars of indignation, then the government can look surprised and can point out that nothing official had ever been said. So far today, there have been no roars of indignation. Not far from London is the town of Greenwich, home of the Royal Observatory. Through Greenwich runs the Zero Meridian on all maps and charts. Ships on all the world's oceans base their positions on the distance they happen to be at the time from this little town of Greenwich. Before they can even determine where they are, the ship's officers have to know just what time it is in Greenwich. All this worldwide activity is centered in Greenwich's Royal Observatory, where the astronomers have been studying the heavens for a good many years. Today, the observatory announced that sunspot activity, which has been interfering with radio and cable communications off and on for several years, is dying down. There was a storm at the beginning of this week, but the five or six year cycle is near its end. The disturbances are growing less severe and less frequent. Greenwich astronomers intended this to be good news for British radio listeners, but British listeners would have appreciated it more if the astronomers had told them where to buy a new radio tube when the old ones wear out. Now back to CBS New York and John Daly. And here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Admiral is devoting all its facilities to making radio communications equipment for the armed forces. Few new Admiral radios are available for civilian use, so today we'd like to use Admiral's time in paying tribute to the Army Signal Corps. Do you recognize this sound? It's made by beating on a hollow log, a means of communication actually used by the Army when the Signal Corps was organized in 1859. For many years, the Signal Corps has been on the job. By 1899, over 40 years ago, the Army Signal Corps already had a radio station in operation. True, it sent messages a distance of only 11 miles from Fire Island to Fire Island Lighthouse, but the foresightedness shown in establishing it made possible the Signal Corps of today. Radio and trucks, tanks, planes. Complete broadcasting and receiving sets so small they can be carried in the palm of the hand. Others so large they develop twice the power of the largest commercial stations in the country. This equipment is saving lives, speeding victory, because the Army Signal Corps developed the kind of radio which meets all conditions imposed by modern war. Admiral is proud to be building such equipment for the Signal Corps. And now... Here once again for Admiral Radio is John Daly. It was just one year ago tomorrow that the Japanese struck at the Hawaiian Islands, leaving our great naval base at Pearl Harbor a mass of sinking and battered warships. There's a different story there today. And Admiral Radio takes you next to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. It was on a Sunday like this, 365 days ago, that this war started for America right here at Pearl Harbor in the island of Oahu in Hawaii. I had a sickening in my stomach as I saw the great ships of our Pacific fleet bombed and torpedoed at their moorings that day. When it was all over, the Arizona was sunk and destroyed. The Oklahoma was turned over, her keel up. The California, Nevada, and West Virginia were far down in the water. The Pennsylvania, the Maryland, and the Tennessee had been hit. The cruisers Helena, Honolulu, and Raleigh were damaged. Two destroyers, the Cassis and the Downs, were destroyed in a dry dock. Another, the shore, seemed to be blown half away. The great old mine layer of Lala was down in the water, and so was the old target ship, the Utah. Two fleet task forces had been carrying out assignments at sea, and two Pacific fleet task forces were in the harbor after extensive operations at sea. Of the 86 ships in the harbor, 19 were sunk or damaged. Both our Army and Navy forces on Oahu lost scores of planes. All this had happened because we, as a nation, had thought Japan would play the game as an honorable nation. Dishonorably, the Japs threw a sneak punch. There was, of course, bewilderment, some confusion, and a lot of disillusionment. Ships stricken, planes crushed, airfields popped back with bombs. There was talk about our leaders. And then all at once, it didn't seem nearly so bad. Men worked as men had never worked before. And ships steamed out one by one to take their place with our fighting fleet. I'll never forget the thrill of seeing a battleship, another battleship that had been in the bottom of Pearl Harbor, 
Going out through the harbor narrows one bright morning, her flag proudly flying, her men lining her decks. She was going out to fight, and we all had lumps in our throats. Of those ships that were struck that reeling blow, only the Arizona is permanently and totally lost. Air strength was replaced in a few days. The fleet had to start fighting immediately. The raids on the Marshalls, Wake, and Marcus Island gave us the fleet uh, gave the fleet the confidence that comes from action. And that action was shown in the Coral Sea and in the invasion of New Guinea. Then the Battle of Midway, and now the Solomons, each action of increasing importance. We have lost ships, but the enemy has lost far more. We have lost men, but the enemy has paid a price manifold. At this minute, our land and sea forces are busy in Guadalcanal and in New Guinea, blasting out the foothold for our future drive toward Japan. Today, one year later, Pearl Harbor looks mighty sweet. The old harbor is bustling, noisy, busy, and men have the bright look of confidence in their faces. And that's the situation out here one year later. This is Webley Edwards at Pearl Harbor. We return you to CBS in New York. American paratroops in North Africa have gone into action for the first time in this war. Their attack followed plans long and carefully rehearsed. For the story of the training of our paratroops, one of Columbia's correspondents has visited one of their camps. We take you to CBS over Lawson Field, Fort Benning, Georgia, Bill Slocum, Jr. reporting. I am standing at the door in the rear of an ace C-47, a cold and efficient piece of flying war machinery. Two benches run the length of the plane. Sitting on the benches, facing across the aisle, are eight young men of the 507th Parachute Regiment. They are going to make today's jump. Now, as we near the jumping point, they are smoking, chatting, and looking the way any man with a grain of sense should look when he's about to jump 1,000 feet straight down. I don't think they realize they are talking a little louder than usual and that there is a grimness about their eyes. They are not afraid. If they were, they wouldn't be parachutists. They're just bright enough to realize that jumping out of airplanes is a job that requires more of the brain than the muscles or even the heart. When jumping time comes, the jump master will order the men to stand up. His next order is hookup. With that, each jumper fastens a hook to a steel cable running the length of the plane. This hook is on the end of a roven wolf, which is fastened to the parachute. The third order is check equipment, and then come the orders for the actual jump. The men step out, right foot first, and arms folded across their chest. When the jumper exhausts the short length of rope attached to the cable, it snaps his chute open, and down he goes. He'll do the thousand feet in about 45 seconds. As they jump, you'll hear them yell their battle cry. The 507th battle cry is Geronimo, and they'll really yell it, too. Each jumper wears a chute on his chest as an emergency chute. They are operated by hand. The jumper packs his own chutes. There are a couple of riggers or repairers on this plane now. Every so often, a rigger has to jump. That custom tends to keep a rigger's mind on his work. Now the motors begin to slow down slowly, and I imagine we're coming in for our jump. Stand up and hook up! There, the lieutenant orders the men to stand up and hook their static Check lines. Equipment. Check equipment. They are now checking the equipment. Each man checks the parachute on the back of the Everybody man in front of them. Okay. Now they're okay. Seven okay. Five okay. Four okay. Three okay. Two okay. One okay. All the parachutes have been checked and they're ready. You can hear them closing up now with their static lines and their Are hooks. Are you ready? Ready! Go! There they go. Go! They went through that like Roxyettes. The jump master's main job is to aim the shootists. He knows where he wants them to land, and after figuring out the wind, why he tells them to go. And he wants to know where he wants to put that lethal cargo which they carry. And lethal it is, too, because when these men land, they unload a devastating firepower and Tommy guns, rifles, mortars, and their very good pal, the hand grenades. Incidentally, the men who jumped for us that time, and they're all going down very nicely now, were Staff Sergeant Spanius, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Sergeant Price of Dillon, South Carolina, Private First Class Wilson of Louisville, Kentucky, Private First Class Sunsbow of Omaha, Nebraska, Private Harvey of DeMine, Iowa, Private LaVisa of Joliet, Illinois, Private Kelly of South Bend, Indiana, and Sergeant Bellow of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yes, parachute jumping is nothing you do for laughs, but it is as safe as any of the arms of the Army of the United States, and it is the highest paid branch, too, which seems reasonable enough. I return you now to John Daly in New York and CBS. Yeah. ...developments here at home, and for news of the fighting in the Solomons, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. 
In Washington, the reaction to the idea of a Pearl Harbor anniversary communique has been generally favorable. Few people here would deny that under the circumstances, our Navy could have done anything else but hide from the enemy the full extent of our tremendous losses. Release of most of the tragic details today has had a sobering effect on the people of Washington. But there's some consolation in the anniversary report of the War Production Board. Though we'll fall short of our production goal by 15% in 1942, the fact that we shall have produced 49,000 airplanes, 32,000 tanks and motorized artillery, 17,000 tons of anti-aircraft, and more than 8 million tons of merchant shipping is really more than we had any right to expect a year ago when we displayed such flagrant weakness at Pearl Harbor. Two hours ago, the Navy Department released another communique. It reports that Marine Corps raiders destroyed five enemy encampments on Guadalcanal last Friday and killed 400 Japanese with a loss to themselves of only 17 dead. Army Aracobra fighters, the Navy says, continue to attack the enemy's bases and on Friday strafed 15 landing barges and rafts near Tassafaranga. This would seem to indicate that the Japanese have been able to land small numbers of troops despite the battle of, the battle of November 30th when we destroyed their latest invasion convoy. Since the publication of the Beveridge Plan for post-war security in the United Kingdom, many people have been wondering if the United States government has not been working on a similar plan. The answer is it has and it's now possible to reveal that a 50,000-word report of the National Resources Planning Board has been lying on President Roosevelt's desk for almost a month. We return you now to CBS New York and John Daly. And here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. All over Europe today, the Nazi-controlled radio is pouring forth its usual torrent of lies, excuses, and edicts of cruelty. Here in America, radio serves a different purpose. To give Americans periods of honest news, such as this Admiral-sponsored program. To entertain, to promote free discussions of public matters, and to aid in understanding the various war measures. Because American radio does these things, a radio set is a necessity in the American home. And the radio you own should give the best possible service at all times. If it doesn't, have your Admiral dealer put it in tip-top shape. Never mind whether your set is an Admiral or some other brand. Admiral dealers are pledged to help keep all radios on the beam for the duration. When victory is won, they'll have new Admiral radios and Admiral radio phonograph combinations. For Admiral will again take its place as the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. But until that time, Admiral will be busy supplying the radio equipment needed by the armed forces. And Admiral dealers will be on the job helping to keep our radios on the home front in perfect operating condition. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen next Sunday when Admiral will again give you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. In spite of what you may have heard or read, our country is critically short of rubber. That, not a shortage of gasoline, is the reason for gasoline rationing. Our armed forces need rubber as much as they need arms and ammunition. Do your part. Obey the spirit as well as the letter of the law. Share your car and go twice as far. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago.